morning. Wait, there's not enough people here, so I want to hear it. Good morning. Fantastic. So how's everyone in day two? Bright, early, ready to go? OK. So I have an important question. Who was on the dance floor last night? Did anyone dance? OK, we have one here. I was on the dance floor representing. Um, so we have the exciting task of entertaining you before lunchtime, which is always, I think, I'm not sure if it's easier before lunch or after lunch or harder, but we're going to try and keep you interested. And our topic is around money and investment. And this is something that we've heard pretty much in every one of the panels, right? Who's going to pay? How will cities go and finance this infrastructure? And as cities start moving, as cities start urbanizing more, the demand gets bigger. So we have an all-star panel here. It's a great mix between financiers, deputy mayors, as well as uh, Julie, who's really looking at it from a research and bringing together multiple viewpoints. So I'm going to hand it over to them to do a quick introduction. And then we're going to go through the objectives of the session and really get into it. We want to make it punchy, interactive, you know, really highlight some of the issues, but also give you some practical examples of what's worked and where we see the gaps. So I'm going to start with the introduction. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bagdi. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, participate on this panel. I am Deputy Mayor for Budapest. Probably some of you know where it is. Budapest is the capital city of Hungary with uh, 2 million inhabitants, which is more or less 20% of the inhabitants of Hungary. But on the other hand, Budapest is uh, the capital city, and we are producing more than 40% of the GDP of Hungary. In fact, uh, I am in a very special position because I used to work sometimes as civil worker for public area and also in private investors. So I try to understand the problems of uh, bridging the investment gap. You have to understand that good civil workers are normally risk avoiders and good investors are normally risk takers. So it's not so easy to bridge this gap. In fact, Budapest has a very long-term plan. If you don't mind, I'll show you some just pictures about Budapest just to understand our problems. And the issue is that uh, we have a long-term plan for 2030. And according to that, our main goal is to develop the shores of the Danube. You can see on most of the pictures that uh, Budapest consists of two parts. And in the middle, there is the big Danube River. And we have to cross the river. And the issue is that we want to get the people closer and closer to the Danube, because at the moment, there are a lot of big main roads along the shore. And this is what we want to change. And also, as you can see on this picture, we have some green parks, public areas, public parks have to be developed in order that people could feel better, more comfortable, and Budapest should be more clean. If we go further on these pictures, and finally, we will get to the main investment problem for us, and it is public transport. When you are in a city which is divided by a big river, and you want to improve public transport, you need a lot of investment, especially metro lines, tram lines, railway lines. And the financing of this long-term so-called social investment is a big issue. Got it. Deputy Mayor, if you don't mind, um, we'll hold off on the specific examples. I'll just do the quick introduction of the panel, and we'll come back. Elena? Uh, hello. My name is Elena Burganska. I am with uh, the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group. We're the private uh, sector arm of the group, and we're the largest global development institution, which is focused on the private sector. Fantastic. Um, I'm the head of uh, global, uh, global head of water and municipal infrastructure. Great. So from development finance, we've got traditional investment banking and municipal finance. Over to you, Najib. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Najib Haider. Uh, I work for Citi, and I run the project and infra infrastructure finance business for the Asia-Pacific region. I've been with Citi for about 20 years and in banking for about 26. Julie? Uh, I'm Julie Kim, um, 2015 Research Fellow in Urban Infrastructure Finance Initiative with New Cities Foundation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the initiative later. 
Uh, I'm also senior fellow and PPP program director at Stanford Global Project Center. Last 10 years, Stanford has been working together with uh, uh, institutional investors to help them invest more effectively in, in the infrastructure space. Uh, so we have been working really closely with pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. Great, and over to you. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Ian Nielsen. I'm the deputy mayor of Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, essentially, I'm a formal civil engineer, uh, but have for the last nine years been in charge of the city's finances uh, and overseen uh, major infrastructure projects for the city. I think it's really interesting that both the public sector leaders here have been in the construction and the civil design, and you do understand the financing challenges, so I think it's great to have your perspectives. Um, can we just get the objective slides on for a second? I just want to make sure I take you through some of the key objectives of what we're trying to get through today. Uh, the first one is we do know that the world is urbanizing. John in his keynote mentioned yesterday that we're creating one Jakarta every year or four Dubais. The demands on infrastructure and citizen services are just going to keep going up. But Elena, as we were discussing yesterday, the private investment for these infrastructure projects has essentially remained flat. So there is a disconnect and there is a gap. And that's precisely what we're trying to address today. Why is that? Is it because there isn't money, right? Is it a lack of money or is it something else? And Jill, you've got a point of view on this, which is the difference between funding and financing, which I think is an interesting concept for us to dig deeper into. And also really trying to understand where do cities um, get most of their funds today? Where are the ones they can get funding for? Where are the ones that they see gaps for? And we've heard a lot about private, uh, private institutions coming in. PPPs are clearly the way that a lot of these projects are financed. But in this group, we have a differing point of view in terms of you know, where PPPs have worked, but also good reasons for why PPPs have not worked, right? Government regulations and things like that. So we want to hear some perspectives. And then what's the role that investment banks and IFIs play in advancing this equation? Because public sector themselves, they don't necessarily have all the tools or the institutional knowledge to go and figure out what's out there. And, and that's really what um, these institutions provide. And finally, we'll close on, Julie, the initiative that you're leading, which I think is a great initiative that NCF is sponsoring. Um, and they've created a fellowship around this. And Cisco, City, and Arab have been the sponsors to really look at this holistically and try and provide a blueprint and something that you can take away down the track. So let's get started. Um, Deputy Mayor Bagdi, I'm going to hand it back to you. If you want to tell us a little bit about you know, what are some of the projects today that you see in Budapest and what are the sources of funding for you today? Mm -hmm. So in fact, Budapest is a quite good uh, position. Uh, okay. So we are in a quite good financial okay, position, okay. but the fact is we need some funding, especially for social infrastructure projects. Here you can see some pictures about Budapest. Here you can see the big Danube, the flat Pest area, and the hilly uh, area of Buda. And I want to mention only one fact, not about financing, but just to know about Budapest. We have very famous thermal buses. Some of them are 500 years old, so if you happen to come to Budapest, don't hesitate to visit one of them. The fact is that we have the most problems with public transport. Here we need a lot of new uh, metro lines, and there is no one who is able and willing financing uh, for metro developments, because they are not really bankable projects. They are some kind of social investments, and the rate of return is not enough to finance it just from commercial banks. Right. So here we definitely need the support of the European Union. So we finance the metro lines partially by a support of the European Union and also there is a state support. And Budapest, the city itself only has to pay a minor, let's say 10% part of the investment. And this is the only way how we can finance this kind of Great. projects. So I, I like that 
um, concept of bankable projects, and we'll, we'll kind of hold on to it as we go through the panel. Um, but I think one of the advantages, as we were talking yesterday, you've got the ability to go tap into European financing, exactly. right? whether it be the European Union or the European Investment Bank. Right? Uh, partially, we can get funds, right. uh, support from the European Union, and we also have an opportunity uh, for the remaining part to have a loan from the European financial institutions like the EIB. Got it. So Deputy Mayor Nielsen, I, I'd like to get your perspectives on Cape Town as a city, and also your perspectives on you know, what are the sources of funding that you tap into today? And I know PPPs aren't necessarily that, that easy on the ground there. Well, certainly, you know, we're a city of four million people that's urbanizing rapidly. Uh, we've grown 30% in the last 10 years, uh, broadly poor people urbanizing from, from the rural areas. Uh, about half of all that we do is basic services. It's water and sanitation, electricity, distribution. Uh, and, you know, we've invested something of the order of $2 billion over the past five years uh, into infrastructure. Uh, the other big areas that, that we are focusing on very strongly is public transport, something that had been neglected for decades, uh, putting in uh, bus rapid transit systems, uh, fortunately significantly funded by the, the national government through, through grant funding. Okay. Uh, but the other area that we've uh, decided that was very important for us was a, a, a fiber network, a broadband network for the city uh, that, uh, you know, that would get us into those areas that the private sector is not going into. Got it. And you know, from your perspective, when it comes to financing of the projects, you mentioned yesterday leveraging the balance sheet is something that is a favored option for you. Certainly, uh, we don't do any project financing at all okay. um, from, from borrowings, if I can put it that way. Uh, essentially, uh, we just take balance sheet uh, funding from the, from the bond market or, or borrowed. Uh, we were also fortunate to get a French development uh, bank uh, loan as well. Uh, we find that that is the easiest and simplest way for us to, to finance our projects. Uh, the difficulty is, is the, uh, when one goes to project financing, uh, most of the institutions that fund those do, do need very bankable projects. And the difficulty of most of the stuff we do as, as a city is that, uh, that it's very difficult to make projects bankable. Right and that you end up trying to, to drop off some of the socioeconomic objectives of, uh, of a project, and that just simply doesn't work. Yeah. So uh, the, the easiest and simplest <coughs> way for us then is to uh, just to get uh, balance sheet funding. Uh, we rely then on the, uh, on the overall financial strength of the city, and, and so uh, lenders look at us from that balance sheet perspective rather than from that particular project perspective. So of course that means that the city must be uh, very well run financially, uh, that it must be strong, have a good credit rating, uh, and also it's important then that the city doesn't, when it uses those borrowed funds, that it pushes the majority of it into income producing infrastructure, such as water for example, or electricity rather than into roads where you don't get an income. Right, got it. So Julie, help us demystify this concept of funding versus financing. So it appears that there is a general consensus, there's plenty of money, uh, especially on the private investment sector. So the problem is not lack of financing, but lack of bankable projects, as many of our uh, panelists uh, talked about uh, in the pipeline. And this is due primarily to two reasons. Number one uh, is the lack of institutional capacity and knowledge gap in the public sector. And second, and perhaps more critically, is the lack of uh, clear revenue or funding stream that can be paid for financing uh, in the end. So regarding the, the lack of uh, institutional uh, capacity, cities need enabling institutions uh, such as very clear uh, you know, uh, policies, uh, rule of law and regulations, uh, processes, organizations, and resources, 
all of these are basic building blocks that they need to really build and gain credibility in the international financial market and also to ensure that the financing terms are honored and the investors uh, can, uh, can keep coming back. It has been found that by far the, the most critical gap uh, is in the early project preparation stage where the cities take their visions and plans and translate them into actual projects that can take it to the investors. And in this regard, in, especially in the developing economies, the IFIs and leading NGOs have been very critical in filling this gap, both in terms of providing technical assistance funding as well as providing their own expert resources. Regarding the lack of funding and revenue sources, we have to recognize a, there is a, a very important uh, distinction between funding and financing. Financing is leveraging of the future revenue of funding stream to raise high initial capital to expedite uh, infrastructure project implementation. So there is no such thing as free money. In the end, it has to be taxpayers or users who have to pay like everything else. So regarding taxes, uh, basically we need some taxing reform where the taxing is based on actual usage and wear and tear of, uh, of, of the facilities. And, and for cities, uh, they need to be more self-reliant and they have to increase and enhance their local taxing authority. That's one of the things that the t t cities can be made more self-reliant. And in that regard, the land value capture approach has been quite effective uh, in many different cities. More and more, uh, tax revenue has to be supplemented by user fees. And in, in this case, the idea is to create value so that users are willing to, willing to pay. And oftentimes, user fees are uh, closely tied to actual cost of providing services right. uh, so that uh, they are more self-reliant uh, in the end. Uh, uh, Collecting user fees can be quite difficult and political, especially in, in the water sector. So oftentimes, you need to combine improved service with a very strong and thoughtful public relations program. Uh, in addition to user fees and taxes, you can also uh, tackle the, the major infrastructure funding gap by reducing the cost of providing services. Mm -hmm. uh, so PPP has been actually quite effective in terms of uh, uh, reducing, reducing the overall project cost by uh, using life cycle approach. Uh, we talk about smart city concepts, uh, sustainability in initiative, various uh, pricing strategies. All of these actually improve the operations and, and maintenance costs through, through efficiency. Thereby, you, you make more use of the existing facilities and, and reducing the gap. And I'd like to make one, one final point. O although there is an oversupply of financing, uh, the investment community to have to be much more uh, creative and robust in catering the, the needs of the cities uh, as they face these, these uh, rapid urbanization. And I have some a few thoughts about that. Number one, uh, I think some of the people talked about in earlier panels, but cities often face scale issues where the projects are perceived to be too small for investable uh, projects. So we need some aggregation tools to really blend multiple investment across multiple uh, cities. Second, because we need to rely more on users, that uh, it may be worthwhile exploring user investment model, uh, uh, such as crowdfunding as well as infrastructure cooperative. Uh, finally, because the funding gap is so, uh, so large and, and daunting, to tackle the sheer magnitude of funding problem, business as, you, as usual will not cut it. We have to really come up with big ideas to, to tackle big problem. And one of the uh, things that's actually being tested now in Australia is uh, what they call brownfield recycling, where they leverage and monetize existing brownfield to raise funding to actually uh, uh, finance the uh, new infrastructure. Got it. So I, I think the key thing for me is it's often the funding that is needed to start the financing and get the interest from the financial community. And I think, Najib, this is where we segue into you because you know, you've got great experience of looking at this in multiple sectors. And so when I think of transport projects, I look at a lot of those transport projects as viable investments because clearly they're ones that you see a lot of investors moving into. So what's your perspective? I mean, first of all, um, what does a role 
uh, what's a role that an institution like City plays in working with local governments and your experience in, in looking at projects in this space? Thanks, Erwin. Uh, I think from a from a uh, from a from from City's perspective, there's two roles um, that we can play. Um, firstly, we can advise the government in putting together a structure that works, um, and each situation is is different, so it requires a bespoke um, uh, financing plan. Uh, funding um, is, is key, that's the source of mm -hmm. cash, so it has to be structured around that. And depending on the sector, uh, you can have a PPP structure, which is uh, where the government would need to step in and provide some form of support, or you can have a pure commercial financing where there are precedents um, of banks and investors, equity and debt, having taken the risk uh, or the market risk of that, that specific uh, uh, sector. And so you can do it without government support as well. Um, so it depends on the situation. So one, one role that, that, that a bank like Citi can play is uh, uh, put together a structure that works for everyone, mm -hmm. keeping in mind the regulatory framework, the legal uh, framework, um, and, and therefore the contracts that can be furnished to lenders. Uh, so that's one area of activity. The other area of activity that we that we quite keen on assisting uh, governments with is actually raising the financing. Um, so we can bring together people like the IFC, uh, multilaterals, um, export credit agencies, commercial banks, uh, capital markets investors, retail investors, um, uh, and uh, sometimes insurance companies. So those are the two areas of support that you know bank like Citi can provide. Got it. Um, you mentioned something about risk versus reward. Right. Often what I hear is how much there's a trade-off in terms of how much um, risk a government takes as opposed to how much risk a financial, the private investors want the government to take. Now, obviously, if the government's guaranteeing revenue streams or a certain amount of savings, that makes it for an easier proposition. What's, what's your sense in terms of that tightrope? Because governments don't want to give away as much. They want right. investors to come in and... Um, Coming in finance as much as possible. Right? What's, I mean, that's a very good question. I think what's what's key to structure uh, to structuring a successful infrastructure financing is the allocation of risks. And, and what you need to do is allocate risks uh, to parties that are most capable of bearing them. Right. Um, in most projects, there's 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 two phases, or lenders perceive two phases. There's the construction phase, and then there's the operating phase. Uh, the construction phase is perceived as risky because you know, there could be cost overruns, there could be delays in completion, uh, there could be issues with land acquisition. Again, depending on, on the specific uh, geography and the specific transaction, the government may need to step in and provide support, but that's usually not the case. So construction is usually a risk that uh, banks, uh, project finance banks can take, um, but then they're taking the risk of the, the people who are actually constructing the, the piece of infrastructure. So if that's a risk that they can they get comfortable with, the next risk is where the funding will come from, who's right. going to use the, use the facility and how will they pay for it. Um, and if there is precedence in the market or if there's a sector that you know, has enough uh, research that banks can, can get comfortable with, then the government may not need to step in. But in many green fields, uh, brand new, even in the transport sector situations, like toll roads, rails, it's usually um, the governments who have to step in with some form of revenue support over uh -huh. a period of time. Um, and, and that's when you step into PPP territory. So most large infrastructure projects will need um, either support, um, the extreme will be support on the revenue side from the government, or if not the revenue side, but they will need a concession. So the sponsors who, who are owning and operating the project will need a clear path of 25, 30 years to be able to do what they need to to make that project run successfully. Got it. So, and so continue. So it's either a concession that the yeah. government provides, the ability to own, operate, uh, that project or actual support from a credit perspective and a revenue perspective. Got it. And we'll come back to uh, the two government leaders here in terms of their perspectives. But first of all, Elena, you look at this from a development finance perspective. Obviously, the, it's a different lens, but you work with the likes of city and other institutions in, in providing some of that guarantee and hedging and credit swaps, et cetera. So what's your sense? First of all, what is the role that IFC plays? Uh, when it comes to infrastructure finance with local governments? And also, what do you need to see more of um, in order to accelerate this? Okay. Um, in terms of the role that we play um, in urban infrastructure development, and we're focusing only on emerging markets as a development institution, um, I would say there are 
four ways that we engage. One is through financing, um, mm -hmm. and that could be anything from straight loans to equity investments to hedging instruments, what have you. Um, and we can do it directly with uh, municipal or other forms of local governments or through the private sector, which Got is uh, our traditional role. Now, by the way, you know, the uh, uh, engaging through the local governments, um, I agree this is a very, very good way of funding or financing uh, urban infrastructure, but do you know that uh, if you look at 500 largest cities in emerging markets, less than 5% of them have any sort of uh, credit rating that is internationally right. recognized. And in many countries, uh, cities are not allowed to borrow at all. Right. So in terms of your second question, sure. just on so, that particular So the Cape Town issue, model definitely would not work. Right? Well, in many countries, no. Yeah. Um, and so one thing that the national governments could do um, is to facilitate that access uh, of uh, municipalities right. to capital markets. Um, it doesn't mean that you just allow everybody to borrow with no limits. It, it means regulating it and setting up some rules of the game, but not letting them do anything at all uh, does not, in my view, does not provide a good incentive in terms of taking control by the local governments of their own future. Got it. So that's one point. Uh, in terms of uh, other ways of engaging, um, we can engage by providing advice and uh, capacity building through our advisory services, um, risk mitigation, and finally, uh, which is another thing, uh, getting to your second question in terms of what's needed, project development facilities. Okay. Because uh, I agree with Julie that money is not so much the issue. The issue in many markets um, is, uh, in most markets, is lack of uh, projects that are financeable. Okay. Um, so tell us a little bit more just on the risk piece, because you know, to Najib's point, risk is key when it comes to uh, allocating risk in terms of financing a project. So what does IFC do in terms of risk mitigation? Well, it, it depends on the project, right? I, I mean, the, 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 the fundamental issue is that, you know, projects are doable when the risks are properly allocated between the parties. Right. And so depending on the sector, depending on the country, depending on the local uh, environment, this could mean different things for different projects. Um, the way we engage is through, for example, providing PPP advice uh, to the government on how to structure uh, a certain transaction okay. or engaging with the, uh, with the project developer on, and the government again uh, to develop projects in certain sectors. Got it. Elena has a flight to catch after this, so if anybody wants to tap into the World Bank money, I'll tell you what flight to catch and where to sit. <laughs> so. Um, Najib's delayed his flight, so he's, he's even easier to address after this. But I want to come back to Deputy Mayor Bagdi and then um, Deputy Mayor Nielsen afterwards. I'd like to get your perspectives on this whole risk-reward perspective. How do you think about it from a government perspective? I mean, we've heard from the private sector view. From a government standpoint, when you address these projects, um, what is the amount of risk that is acceptable? Not an easy question. This, uh, that We're trying to be easy. controversial. Yeah. So <laughs> to tell the truth, not also banks try to avoid risk, but also municipalities try right. to avoid risk. So there is always a discussion. And I completely agree that risk should be with those parties who can manage the risk. Right. And that's why it depends on projects. In Budapest, Hungary, we have had some very bad experience with PPP projects because there were projects where the, how to say, the potential profit was allocated to the private partner and the potential risk allocated to the municipality. These are bad examples. The example is, for example, uh, when we had a, a, let's say, a brownfield site and the municipality had not enough money to develop it and to make it uh, and build a commercial center. And the private investor made the project but they wanted to secure long-term revenue from the city instead of uh, uh, 
securing the revenues for himself because a commercial uh, building is nothing else but just a, a business for a private investor. On the other hand, I completely agree if there is about, uh, let's say, public transport issues, then, then the uh, municipality or the state has to back the project in some way and securing the revenues. Right. So it depends on the project. But Absolutely. in any way, we also try to avoid risk. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and, and you have the, um, the, the voters to be responsible for, right? Which yeah, often might sure. be harder than the shareholders themselves. <laughs> Um, Deputy Mayor Nielsen, your, your perspectives from Cape Town as to how do you think about risk on projects? Well, we, first of all, we don't do a great deal of what's, what's normally considered uh, public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, we have very rigorous legislation in our country uh, aimed at uh, primarily getting rid of corruption, uh, which means to go into any PPP, you have to go through... Uh, sometimes a three to five year process of appointing adv investment advisors and a whole lot of other uh, people and so we just we just tend to avoid that because it's just too difficult and we try and find other ways such as leasing for example or selling property for for private sector to develop uh, there, there we look to see where as far as possible to reduce risk uh, before we put something out to the market so for example uh, if we sell in property for, for development, uh, the, we go through the process of, of rezoning it and giving it all, all the property rights first so that uh, when a, a property, when a purchaser buys it, in, they know they, are re they can go ahead immediately. So I think that's, that's our, our approach is essentially uh, risk reduction as far as we can do. Great. So let's get into a couple of practical examples because I think... This has really set the stage, but I want to get into some examples of PPPs and financing projects which have been successful. Um, so I want to start with you, Najib. You, you talked about the one in the power space. If you want to give a bit of perspective as to how it was structured, who was involved, how was risk allocated between these parties, and where did the funding come from? Sure. So I'll, 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 since we are in Indonesia, I think it's appropriate to talk about a project in Indonesia. Great. Um, it's a project called Banten Power Project. Uh, we closed the financing in December 2013. It's a, a billion dollar investment. Um, and, and the backdrop is uh, we know Indonesia from a macro microeconomic perspective has been doing quite well over the last decade or so, and, and therefore the demand for power is clearly there. Um, and so the government has uh, embarked on a program to add as much capacity as possible um, and as soon as possible. So this was a project that was uh, bid out um, uh, through a competitive process. Genting, uh, which is a, a, a power developer uh, from Malaysia, won the concession. Um, it's a 25-year power purchase agreement that they won. Um, so the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the key, key um, um, underpinning factor um, that the government uh, offered in this transaction was the power purchase agreement, which PLN, which is a national utility, right. signs up for. Uh, so the first stage, uh, construction, uh, uh, Genting puts in 25% equity, 75% of the funding comes through debt from Malaysia Exim and commercial banks, including Citi. Um, during the construction period, um, the risk um, is borne by the lenders and the sponsors. So uh, the risk of the plant being constructed on time uh, and on budget is being borne by the lenders and partly yeah. by the sponsors. Uh, to the extent of their equity portion. And the, the party that's bearing that risk, uh, in addition to the lenders, is the con contractor, which is a company called Harbin from China. Okay. Uh, so they're a very big uh, coal uh, equipment supplier. Um, so Harbin provided a fixed-priced, uh, date-certain construction contract. So that's, that's, that's the construction period. Um, during the operating period, uh, PLN, which is the off-taker, bears the mm -hmm. risk of the revenues. Uh, and that's a risk that's very bankable. And that's how the lenders got comfortable. And within that power purchase agreement, um, they uh, assure the project of a certain minimum level of revenue. Um, so even if the plant is not operating but is available, mm -hmm. uh, PLN is obligated to make that minimum payment, which is uh, sizable enough to pay back debt and some equity return. In addition to, um, uh, to paying back the fixed cost, what PLN does under that power purchase agreement is it taking the, the coal price risk. Um, so uh, one of the other major risks is fuel, um, and the lenders in this case were able to take the 
the, the, the risk of fuel availability. And, and a key important feature in this project from an Indonesia perspective is it's based on local coal. Right. Um, indigenous fuel projects are usually uh, preferred by governments uh, globally. Uh, so the coal comes from companies' uh, mines in Indonesia. Uh, the availability of coal, that risk is being borne by the project company and therefore the lenders and the sponsors. The price of coal is passed on to the, to the off-taker, which is PLN. Right. Um, so what we see here is um, you know, commercial parties taking risks that are key, uh, construction mm -hmm. risk, coal supply risk, the government through PLN taking the risk of offtake, uh, right. of, um, of, uh, of, of demand. Um, and, and you have here an interesting combination of a Malaysian sponsor, Chinese EPC contractor, and, and the project being located in Indonesia. So you have multiple geographies involved, uh, and you have parties that are capable of adding value to this whole proposition involved from various jurisdictions. Great. Um, Julie, you, you've got some experience in the transport sector. Right. Uh, so basically, uh, there is sufficient data to indicate that uh, the PPP actually improves efficiency through their life cycle cost. Uh, you know, there is a great deal of efficiency gain, but that efficiency gain can be wiped out by high financing cost of involving private sector. So it's all about risk allocation. Uh, and the particular project that I have in mind is the N33 toll road project in, in Netherlands. And, and the reason why this was a successful PPP was number one, uh, the, there was an optimal risk allocation among all the parties that was involved. Number two, it addressed, it, it was actually a greenfield project involving new construction, which is notoriously difficult to finance because of the perceived construction risk. And then oftentimes, greenfield, you need to refinance after construction is complete right. because the cost goes down once the, so, so that was second part. And then third, very important part is that it involved public pension funds directly in, in the deal so that the public pension fund put in both the equity uh, and, and they took the risk as well as a long-term uh, financing, debt financing, which kind of removed the, uh, the refinancing uh, uh, cost. So, so basically, a lot of the institutional investors, the pension funds, they go through third-party fund managers uh, uh, and, and oftentimes that really adds a lot of fee to the actual financing cost. So having them really directly getting involved on the project, you really end up cutting, cutting a lot of financing and risk premium. So overall, uh, I think that the, the debt payment, net present debt payment, they end up actually reducing it to five to 10%, which was right. quite substantial. Okay, can you explain why you mentioned pension funds? There are certain class of investors that are attracted to these type of long-term payback cycles, right. right? These infrastructure projects often, I mean, in the case that you mentioned, Najib, it's a 25-year project. Insurance companies, pension funds, wealth <coughs> funds, they can take this risk appetite. So explain a little bit to the audience in terms of why is that class of investors attracted and why is this risk something they'll take? Right, so the in institutional investors are pension funds, insurance companies, and sovereign wealth funds, and they have the ability to hold the, their capital long term. And they are not interested in high return, high risk. They are interested in actually low, you know, low risk, stable return long-term inf inflation protected type of investments. And what's been happening in the past uh, is that uh, because their allocation infrastructure was small, they, they relied on third-party fund managers to help them invest in this space. And one of the things that we've been doing at Stanford is actually working together with them very, very closely to align their long-term interest with the long-term project demand of the, the infrastructure capital. Got it. So, so what we, are, we are looking at a number of models such as insourcing, doing it themselves with, I mean, as the allocation increases, or different models of peer-to-peer -peer collaboration with other pension funds and other sovereign wealth funds to co-invest in different projects and, and sharing the expertise together. So. Got it. So what, one of the other concepts you mentioned when you were explaining funding versus financing is often we think of new sources of revenue. Yes. But it's not just about new sources of revenue. Governments already have a budget, right. and they spend that on critical infrastructure, mm -hmm. whether it be power, whether it be roads, it could be security. And Deputy Mayor Nielsen, when we were talking about just the, the project that you undertook in Cape Town in terms of creating that network, and the reason why I think that's interesting is it touches on a couple of things. One, you saw a need, 
but this whole concept of passing on the user pay model with the Wi-Fi network and then laying on additional things, I think, is very innovative. And as you start looking at what technology can do in cities, I think creating that platform and the city really taking ownership of it is fascinating. Do you want to share a little bit about the project and where you see it evolving? Well, certainly back in 2008, uh, we decided to implement a city-wide network, uh, or fiber network, uh, primarily to st at the beginning was to connect all our municipal buildings. We have uh, over 100 clinics, 100 libraries, uh, many other municipal buildings and depots and, and so on across the city. And uh, those all communicated through telcos or some other sort of um, uh, form. So we set this network, which is now 560 kilometers of, of, of fiber, and it's probably going to double and treble uh, as we go on. Uh, but essentially, the, the issue here was how, do we, how did we fund this? And the essential thing was we funded it through savings. Right. So uh, we, we saved our several million rands, well, um, dollars, shall we say, but a year, in terms that we don't pay the telcos anymore because it's all internal calls now in our system. And even we connected all into all the, the telcos uh, data stations. And uh, so we can direct all external calls directly to, to the, the right telco. Right. Uh, so that even brought down our, our external costs. And, and obviously, we then have a far better system within the municipality, far more uh, with a greater capacity, bandwidth capacity means that uh, some of our, our big data sets and, and mapping systems and, and photography and so on can be used by people all over the city uh, uh, organization. But having established that, what we then also decided, this was not just going to be a, 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 a network for the municipality alone, but we would make it an open access network. Right. Uh, so... Uh, we make the network available to ISP companies, to telcos, to anyone who wants to, to hire from us or use our spare capacity. Uh, and so that's created an, in, an income stream as well. Right. Uh, so it's also meant we've been able to diversify the, that, that sector in our city. We ha so there's greater competition amongst even small and medium level ISPs can now operate in the city because they don't need to put in their own network. Um, and then we're obviously uh, expanding that as far as possible to, uh, to other government institutions that, that want to use it. Right. Universities are connecting into it. The, uh, uh, you know, some of the national government departments even are now using it. Uh, but what we've also done then is having this network in place is to, we've put uh, Wi-Fi hotspots all over the city. We, rolling out, we have several hundred now, we can have, you know, uh, extend those used in all our, all our libraries, for example, as, as hot, hot spot places. And we've offered that again to the private sector. So we don't offer any services. Um, and so we have, example, three, uh, three ISP companies that provide free services over these, this Wi-Fi network. So our model essentially is one of, it's like the road network. You know, you provide the roads and people run right. businesses on them. We provide this infrastructure and we, we make it available to, uh, to the private sector Absolutely. to run. So that's, that's generated the income. Uh, so the financing was some of our balance sheet financing mm -hmm. to cover the first couple of years, but the, the, the payback is, is working well. And now that you have this infrastructure on board, you've essentially got a platform for other companies to start innovating on top. So as you think about whether it be smart lighting or smart parking or having you know, the apps that we saw in What Works yesterday. As on, now that you're creating that digital layer, others can really sit on top, which I think is fascinating. And you're going to see a lot more of the different types of payback models, net new revenue, et cetera. Um, so I want to make sure that we leave about 10 minutes for audience Q&A. While we pick the first question, I want to come to you, Elena. We had this conversation yesterday around user pays and from a development perspective you know is it fair to push all that down to the poor how do we ensure that we have this balance in terms of what is critical infrastructure which gets financed by the government what gets pushed down to everybody from a cost standpoint 
And if we can also, if you can think through questions in the meantime. That's an interesting question. And uh, uh, several points. Number one, achieving social objectives actually has a cost, right? right. So the question is who pays? Um, um, whether it's the government from its own budget, whether it's the user fees, whether it's something else, but it has a cost. What, um, and I think until uh, there is a clear kind of transparent dialogue on, on this, it's very difficult to, um, to achieve certain objectives. So for example, if you take water, um, so people, you know, you hear a lot about uh, it's water should be free. Uh, it's a social good. You know, somehow it's okay to pay for power, but it's not okay to pay for water. Right. Um, and if you think about it, it's, uh, it makes no sense. Um, it's, uh, there is, for a number of reasons, there is good data that shows that actually free water is very costly for the poor. Uh, there is research, I think, done by the World Bank that shows that in India, for example, poor, on average, pay four to five times more per drop of water than the rich. Wow. Because, you know, the network does not give them access to, 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 to water, so they pay for bottled water of uncertain quality, and, and it's much more expensive. Um, then when it's free for all, when there is no price signals that determine behavior of people who use it, then there are huge inefficiencies in the system. People abuse, uh, overuse uh, water. So again, it's not the question of uh, you know, pushing everything to the poor, uh, but there are very good arguments actually that if you start treating something like water as economic good, right. um, there are huge benefits to the poor uh, that come from that. Absolutely. Um, so any questions from the audience? Okay, I see one at the back. Please. Thank you. Let me introduce myself. My name is Rudianto from Nepeng.com. We provide carpooling services in Indonesia. Currently, we have 62,000 members to do carpooling in Indonesia to save fuels and reducing traffic jam in Jakarta. But uh, potentially, we have uh, 11 million in greater Jakarta that own private vehicles. Uh, we have op operated in Indonesia for 10 years, but that's all. We just got 62,000 members because we don't have big server infrastructure. We don't have big digital layers. So why don't you switch your financing for building routes just to create another traffic jam in Jakarta and switch it to build server infrastructure for me? So we can attract 11 million people from greater Jakarta to reduce traffic jams. Thank you. Um, so was that cell phone infrastructure, is that what I heard? Uh, pardon? Uh, the, the last part, was it creating cell phone infrastructure? No, uh, I, I think it is, uh, you, you said about uh, cities. Sure. So why don't you give a loan to governor of Jakarta, the government of Jakarta, to build Jakarta server infrastructure? It is like you are building roads that is financed by government of Jakarta, but Blue Bird Taxi will enjoy this. They can uh, finance its uh, taxi cars, thousands of taxi cars, because they don't have to build the roads. Right. It's Got exactly it. like the same for me. I have an application for car rolling services, but if I don't have the roads, the bigger roads. Right. So here I am, right. 62,000 members only, and still Jakarta is a miserable traffic jam. 
But if you give me. <laughs> right. Don't, don't worry, we, we saw the traffic jam yesterday, um, yes. even with the police escort. So uh, I don't have to seduce you that yeah. Jakarta no, is a big understand. problem. Yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you. So I think the question is how, how do we uh, drive more infrastructure locally? And Najib, you want to take this? I'm, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not entirely clear what, what kind of infrastructure. Uh, is it road happen? infrastructure? Vehicles, I don't quite understand. Server infrastructure. You said digital layers. Right. Not roads. Right. How we move the traffic jams in the roads into traffic internet. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is connectivity. So it might be the concept that you're talking about, Deputy Mayor Nielsen, in terms of providing more of that digital layer. So more of the travelers are connected, and if you're starting to provide more of a carpooling service, it's not like widening the roads immediately is a viable option. Maybe you need to have that connectivity layer to enable business models like this, if I, if I understand the question. Well, I think, you know, we need to move into public transport in a big way rather right. than welding roads. I think that's, that's uh, you know, roads just takes up more and more space. You need parking space as well for the cars that sit there all day. I mean, we just took our, our, our normal model in terms of our zoning schemes, uh, parking requirements and road, road requirements. You can free up uh, one third of the space if you put people onto public transport rather than, than putting them in, into private vehicles. Uh, so I, I don't believe that cities can survive anymore with just building roads. Right. Uh, and, and so most of the effort needs to go into public transport, and obviously it depends on the, on the particular model of the area. And, and sometimes that may mean also helping to finance vehicles, the, the public transport vehicles. So, you know, for example, in, in the bus rapid transit system we're rolling out, we're giving uh, contracts to, uh, to private companies that they were previously ran little minibus taxis. They put those, those people into companies and they've given up their taxis and we've given them bus, a 12-year bus contract. Um, and, and, and by doing that, uh, we, we, we also finance the purchasing of the buses. So um, again, the, the model is, is in, the, in assisting uh, the private sector to come and operate a functioning uh, public transport system. Got it. Please. Um, can we get him? Thanks very much. I'm Richard Warden. I'm with uh, working with the OECD. I formerly was at the World Bank, and I noticed a bunch of articles in the paper today, the Jakarta Post, that were related to, especially the issue um, you brought up, Mr. Hajib, about the coal. Um, one of the things we're doing right now is looking at renewable energy and energy consumption uh, potential for more energy efficiency. So the question arises when I listen to the conversation, I, I don't hear, and I know all about the social and environmental safeguards, the bank is now reviewing and revising to mimic more what the IFC has in the performance standards. The new Asian Development Bank, the AIIB, China and the BRIC Bank are also following suit as well as the ADB. So. There's a lot of issues kind of intertwined here, and I'm going to try to be as articulate and concise as possible, but I didn't hear any kind of calculation or, or any calculus in the uh, discussion about how we can go from a strictly financial analysis of a particular investment and consider, for instance, the climate impacts of coal. Uh, government is planning to build 35,000 uh, uh, megawatts of power in the country over the next four or five years. I just read today, the vice president says um, right here in the paper that the first 10,000 have to be coal because it's quicker and, and faster. It's a, it's a, uh, he, says a fa he calls it a fast track approach. So, and, and there's a number of other articles that are related to this issue. And so the issue, uh, my question is, how do we uh, try to marriage or marry the, um, the longer term, more kind of nebulous or uh, ubiquitous types of factors into these kind of hard financial calculations so that we take into consideration the risk of uh, a climate, a carbon constrained future in which we might have to strand assets or uh, prematurely close power plants sure. down? I'm, I'm very so, no, I, I, so uh, 
Najib, I think it'd be good for you to take it and then yeah. also have the government perspective um, on how they look at this as well. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a very relevant question given uh, the world today. Um, just, just like to add to what you said in terms of the World Bank, the IFC, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that's coming up, Citi was one of the two banks that founded what we call the equator principles. Um, so we're very aware of environmental impacts that projects have, uh, not only power, but across the board. Uh, coal is an interesting situation globally, especially for the emerging markets. Now, it's usually the governments who come up with the power plan. So you know, they want to come up with their power mix, uh, coal, gas, hydro, nuclear. Um, so that's what the governments usually do. Um, what we do as financiers is, financiers is make sure that the, the, the technology that uh, the sponsors are employing is the best in class. So for example, the, the project I mentioned is ultra-critical technology, so it's very efficient coal and as clean as it can get with today's technology. Uh, so I think the option of not having coal at all for countries that are in emerging markets and have that as a major fuel source is probably not a realistic one, at least in the shorter time frame. There are other technologies that we finance, uh, for example, solar, that's becoming more and more prevalent, but it's still much more expensive in terms of capital costs compared to gas or coal-fired projects. So I agree, all, all projects have their environmental uh, impact, um, and that needs to be assessed. And there's always a, a pros and cons discussion that in the first instance, the governments need to, to, to make, and then chalk out that strategy and how how, uh, how they'll manage that impact going forward. So I think we've just got the wind up on this. I just want to give, Julie, if you just get 20 seconds on the urban finance infrastructure piece. I know you're doing a meetup right after this. Right. Uh, so Financing Urban Infrastructure Initiative was launched early uh, by uh, NCF. And this initiative was generously sponsored by uh, Cisco City and, and Arab. The goal is to address the critical financial uh, priorities for cities a, as they uh, face the daunting challenge of providing basic infrastructure services to keep up with the rapid urbanization. So in the last uh, few months, we've been conducting extensive interview uh, with many people from different stakeholder communities such as IFIs and private investment communities and governments and, and academia. And in addition, we've done quite a bit of uh, extensive uh, literature review on, on, the, on the subject matter uh, as well. At the end of this year, the goal is to produce uh, uh, practical financing guidelines for cities and urban areas that, that they can use. But in addition, we're also trying to come up with a actionable and practical set of recommendations addressed to a different uh, stakeholder community. Uh, at this point in time, right now, uh, currently, we'll be doing a pilot study uh, to look at uh, the, the smart city concepts and, and kind of to figure out what are some of the financing challenges and whether we can come up with some new ideas about helping to finance some of these uh, wonderful concepts. Got it. So help is on the way. That's the good news. Right. And, and just like to mention that right after this session, there will be a meetup group where I'll talk more about the initiative and some of our early findings. So there will be a 20, 30-minute presentation and Q&A uh, session. And it will be in breakout room A, I believe. Fantastic. Well, uh, please join me in giving a round of applause to this very interesting and uh, great panel. So thank you very much. <laughs>